Um, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Uh, a very warm welcome to this webinar, uh, Museums as Climate Actors. Um, my name is Jules Krachtenhorst. I am the CEO of RMI, and I am very grateful to welcome you here all today and to talk today about this important initiative connecting climate change to the role of uh, art organizations and very specifically museums. We're facing a planetary emergency. Just a couple of weeks ago, the International Panel on Climate Change highlighted the fact that uh, it is now code red for humanity to address climate change. And today we have an opportunity to explore the important role that fine art and more specifically museums can play in solving this climate crisis. Buildings around the world are responsible for an astonishing 40% of greenhouse gas emissions. Museums, old and new, are contributors to this problem. But many museums lack the resources to make buildings more sustainable and energy efficient. Thanks to the vision of the Helen Frankenthaler Foundation, a new initiative is helping museums reduce their carbon footprint while reducing their energy cost. To tell us more about this initiative, it is my pleasure here to introduce Fred Eisenman. Fred is chairman and CEO of CI Capital Partners, LLC, uh, but he is also a member of the board of the Frankenthaler uh, Foundation. Uh, Fred is based in New York, but joins us today from Madrid. Uh, and Fred, uh, let me start by remembering this conversation that you and I had about six months ago when you called me up uh, being introduced by a mutual friend saying there is a real opportunity here to do something that um, our foundation can contribute. And, and I think uh, it, it was something that came very much out of your heart. So can you tell us a little bit of what led to that inspiration? Absolutely. Thank you, Jules. Um, the, um, I'm lucky enough to serve on the board of the Morgan Library, okay? And I was at a Morgan Library board meeting and it was my first board meeting. And I was sitting there and I, I have been assigned to the, builds in, uh, the Building and Grounds Committee because, I, because of this question I asked, okay? Uh, um, which was about the, whether or not they had looked at sustainability and, 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 and the cost of energy in the course of their renovation, which of course they had. Um, and I talked afterwards to Colin Bailey, who's an old friend of mine and runs the Morgan, about the remaining issues that they had, which they had a $1.6 million need for cooling towers to reduce their carbon footprint. And that was percolating in my mind. At the same time, I've been very active in <coughs> sustainability and climate change issues. Um, Jules knows um, uh, in the last week, my fund just purchased a company that consults for utilities and the United States government, FEMA, EPA, et cetera, et cetera, called Cadmus. That company is working on one thing, which is sustainability. Uh, also consults for the German government. Everywhere across our portfolio, we're trying to reduce our carbon footprint. So uh, I'm a convert, okay? 10 years ago, I was as ignorant as, as, as many of the people who are gonna be coming to the museums and maybe, maybe will become converts themselves. Um, and I've become a convert myself. And, and the mutual friend who introduced us has had a lot to do with that, a director of RMI. And I've been extremely impressed uh, uh, over and over again by, R, by RMI's um, work. So I had, and the Helen Frankenthaler Foundation has been using the legacy of, of Helen, who was my aunt, my mother's sister, and the money that she left to use, to address social issues within an arts context, because it's an arts foundation. And so we've addressed social equity issues. We 
gave several million dollars for people who in the art world weren't covered by government handouts and, and, and payments and, 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 and insurance during the COVID uh, crisis and uh, would, be, would have been starving, literally starving artists. Um, and so I started to think, wait a minute, why aren't we addressing climate? It's the biggest emergency on the planet. And we are in a unique position to do so. So I called Colin back and I had a conversation with him. And I said, you know, is there anybody who helps you? Is there any place you can go? And he said, frankly, no. And I called another friend who's Ian Wardropper, who's the head of the Frick. And Ian explained to me his situation, which is that he gets money from the city council of New York in their renovation, et cetera, et cetera. So I talked to a few museum directors, but I didn't find that they had any solution and that there was a void there. And then I called Jules and I said, could we cook up a solution? And Jules was extremely enthusiastic as he usually is. And he introduced me to Jamie Mandel who was head of buildings. And we began to talk about what could be done and what the different stages are. And, 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 and not to be pedantic about it, but stage one is envisioning what can be done, i.e. having some environmental engineering that, that says, okay, here's the building as it is today. It could be a, a, a 150 year old building like the Met. And what do you do with that? It could be a new build building or it could be a building that's being built right now. And how do you bring it to climate neutral? How do you bring it to carbon zero? And so environmental engineers can do that, but most people don't have access to environmental engineers. So one thing we thought we could do would be to provide access to environmental engineering expertise so people could envision, and we could pay for that because it's not that expensive relative to the cost savings that you get from environmental savings. Um, Clean energy is cheaper than dirty, dirty energy. And so, uh, and so I, in conversations with Jules and with Jamie, who was then RMI's head of buildings, identified that as, as step one of what we could do. Step two of what we could do would be once one had decided what was, what was, going, what was needed, so let's say you're going to put solar on the roof, or let's say you're going to use community solar, or let's say you're going to, uh, energy is the second largest cost of, of, a muse of running a museum. There's staff and then there's energy. And uh, a lot of energy is devoted to keeping things at a certain temperature. Sarah can address this later. I learned a lot from her about the 70 degree de debate, keeping things at exactly a certain temperature in museums consumes a lot of energy, but anyway, once you've identified what you want to do, then you need a plan to do it. So that's another kind of engineering, i.e. the, 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 the pre-doing the pre planning. And that was also something that we could do, okay? And some of, our, some of our recipients have been clever enough to apply for both of those, okay? And then the third thing we could do is often the infrastructure that is needed for saving energy is not the chicest thing that a museum can offer to its donors as a, as, 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 as a, a, a cause to support. It should be, but people would rather give a painting, they'd rather have their name on a room, they'd rather have a gallery named after them, and uh, a cooling tower, as Colin was saying to me, was, was nothing that he could easily get financing for. The, you know, the, 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 the Jules Korsenhorst cooling tower, you know, doesn't get the kind of visibility that the, 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 a gallery would. So these things are difficult to fund. So having an initial grant or a matching grant, even if it's a relatively small amount relative to the cost, can be very, very meaningful to an institution in terms of launching it. So we identified these three things. 
And then I thought about it. And I thought about this in the context of my aunt. My aunt was somebody who was very much wed to nature. And I'm not telling you that, I mean, I never went camping with Helen in my life. I did go sailing with her. But Helen, I mean, the picture that you just saw up there um, is Cool Summer. And it, I, I take credit for the idea of putting Cool Summer up there as, as the emblem for FCI because the summers are now awfully hot, okay? And, 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 and also, I like the inversion of Cool Summer because summer's not supposed to be hot. And things are, are, are a little wacky. But Helen always lived by the sea. My whole adult life, every time I knew her, Helen had a place by the water. She, she thirsted for the ocean and the sky. And many, many, many of her paintings are, 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 are referred to uh, nature. She spent her summers in Provincetown where I visited her. She lived in Stanford, Connecticut by the water. She lived in, in elsewhere in Darien, Connecticut by the water. And, and literally, I mean, sea level. And so the, and, and I also thought about the influence of museums and how many people go, 7 million people a year go through the net. And so if you can enlist in museums, museums are thought leaders. Life imitates art more than the reverse. <clears throat> so I went to the foundation and to, at a board meeting and it's a small board led by the wonderful, uh, Elizabeth Smith's our wonderful executive director. And I proposed this idea as a new initiative to my fellow directors. And I was met with incredible enthusiasm. I mean, just my cousin Clifford, who's the same age, who's chairman of the foundation, had just a big grin on his face, okay? And, uh, um, and, 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 and loved the idea. Elizabeth was very excited, Lise Motherwell, was, was, who's my cousin uh, uh, through Helen's marriage to Bob Motherwell was very, very excited as was Michael Heck. And so we all started thinking about it and, and Pifford kept saying, this is such a big idea. This is such, such, such a big idea. And, 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 and this can go so far. And I was quickly introduced to Sarah Sutton by Jamie. And what I learned from Sarah was that we would be alone, that there's no other program that's doing this in the United States of America. And I'm sure there are lots of programs you know, that the German government's doing, et cetera, et cetera, but that we were alone. Nobody else was doing this. So I thought, here's a chance to lead. Here's a chance to lead in a direction that's terribly important. And uh, uh, the rest uh, went from there. Uh, uh, so Jules, there's your answer. Thank you. And I really have, you have so comprehensively laid out the logic and the argument. Uh, so thank you for that. But I have one follow up question. Uh, you and I have gotten to know each other. And I think we recognize in each other deep passion. Um, you um, have a deep passion for art and a deep passion for sustainability, which as you explained, you've, you've newly found, but this issue of climate change was not on on everybody's horizon for the last 30 years. I only came to this subject 15 years ago when I started to read on the planetary emergency that we face. And in your mind, how would, how would your aunt think about passion as an inspiration for the program that we are launching here today? I'm smiling because um, Helen would love this, okay? Because Helen, uh, Helen was immensely smart. Uh, and uh, she had this way of, uh, she, when, when she would go, she had this, uh, um, this, this cognitive hum where she would go, literally, it was a sound she'd make. She'd go, it was as if she were eating something. She would, she would eat a thought the way you, you eat, you'd eat something delicious because she, she also loved food. But she'd go, mmm. And then, and then, as she digested the thought, and then she'd say, I got it, okay? And, and while we'd be discussing something. And in this case, Helen would be, Helen was a very passionate person herself. She was very, very bright and very rational, but also uh, uh, um, uh, 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 extremely, extremely well-informed 
very informed on, 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 on governmental, political, and current issues. Um, and she would have been, uh, uh, she would have been painting. Let me go this far, okay? I think she would have been painting. I think that this, the, is, this would have been reflected in her painting. I can imagine her being depressed by it. And because I, I, I knew Helen when she was depressed by things and I saw her depressed paintings come out of that period. I was just discussing with, with, with an art critic recently about they were asking about a certain period, what was going on in Helen's life at a certain period. Mm -hmm. And I said, where, where, there's, where there's a certain joy. And I said, well, that's when she met her second husband. And they said, oh, okay, got it, okay. But, um, and I think Helen would be painting, uh, 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 painting around this subject or around her feelings around this subject because um, uh, she was, she was, I mean, she's an artist. So she was expressive and she wasn't an artist who was expressive solely in their work. I mean, I never knew Van Gogh, but my, my guess is that, that Van, I'm not sure, I, I don't know, he actually wrote a lot. But the question is, you know, there's some people who are, I mean, Bob Motherwell, her husband, Bob was a philosopher and Bob, Bob was not somebody who would, would address in conversation what was necessarily coming out in his paintings. But, uh, but in Helen, there was a consistency. And, the, uh, um, and, 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 and she was very conversant. And, 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 and it, so, so I would go so far as to say that if Helen were alive today, and I wish she were because I miss her, um, this would be in her work. Super. How wonderful to link uh, the name giver of the foundation and the source of the success of the foundation to the work that we're discussing today. Thank you, Fred. We'll come back to you during the panel. Um, sure, sure. Can I now ask um, uh, to introduce uh, our panelists? Um, we have Elizabeth Smith, who is the executive director of the Helen Frankenthaler Foundation. Um, uh, and she joins us from New York City. And she just told me earlier that uh, prior to becoming the ED, uh, she spent many, many decades uh, as a curator of museums. Um, on the panel today as well is Sarah Sutton, already referred to here before, uh, the CEO of Environment and Culture uh, Partners uh, and the administrator of the Frankenthaler Climate Initiative Grants Program. And Sarah is with us from uh, Tacoma, Washington. And finally, uh, pleased to introduce my colleague, Victor Oge. Uh, Victor is a bioclimactic architect and a principal uh, of the Low Embodied Carbon Program, uh, of the Buildings Program uh, at RMI. And uh, Victor is here in uh, beautiful Boulder, Colorado. So um, let me start uh, with you, Sarah. Uh, can you tell us uh, how important is the cultural sector in addressing climate change? And, and why hasn't it gained more momentum yet? Why are we uh, just now seeing the cultural sector starting to adopt climate action? Thank you, Jules. Well, I think this is a whole of society issue that we have to tackle. Climate change, as you said, is an emergency and it's time for every sector to step up. Museums are included. On occasion, they wish that they could step out and I just see no path for them to do it. They've been slow to pick up on it because this is mission-based work and many institutions like art museums and history museums felt that the mission was more appropriate for science and children's museums rather than art and history. But this is an anthropogenic issue. And so I'm glad to see that they've all come along and joined the fray as well. I think maybe um, we'll have uh, Elizabeth give us a start and then I'll follow in with descriptions of some of the awards at the end of the presentation. Great, thank you. Elizabeth, over to you. And I think you have to unmute yourself probably. Hello. All right, good. Um, thank you, Jules and Sarah, uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm so pleased uh, to give some additional background on the origins and the status of this newly launched Frank and Dollar Climate Initiative following on the points raised so eloquently um, by Fred Eisman just now. Um, could I have the next slide, please? 
So abstract expressionist Helen Frankenthaler is recognized among the most important American artists of the 20th century. She's an artist whose career spanned approximately 60 years from the late 40s to the early 2000s. And during her lifetime, she established a foundation to receive a bequest of artworks, research materials, and financial assets after her death. Since becoming active in 2013, our foundation has um, served as a steward of the artist's legacy, collection, and archive. We promote the visual arts more broadly through a range of philanthropic, educational, and research initiatives. Could I have the next slide, please? And you'll also get a chance to appreciate some additional paintings by Helen Frankenthaler um, to which Fred alluded. Uh, the Frankenthaler Climate Initiative, which we announced early this year is the most recent of our initiatives. It builds on the commitment to social impact philanthropy that we began in 2020 with our COVID-19 relief effort. And it reflects the foundation's belief that the arts should lead the way in addressing critical issues of our time. The FCI is the first nationwide program supporting energy efficiency and clean energy use for the visual arts. It's the largest private national grant making program of its kind to address climate change action through cultural institutions. Could I have the next slide, please? The program's goals are to facilitate the adoption of practices and the development of systems that reduce production of greenhouse gases and to provide advice to visual arts institutions and the funding needed to reduce energy usage and impact. The desired outcomes are to lower operational expenses so that museums can have more resources to devote to pursuing their missions, to increase institutional sustainability and to limit global impacts that contribute to a changing climate. Next, please. In this, our inaugural year, we received 110 proposals. The quality, quantity, and significance of the proposals was so compelling that our trustees decided to award $5.1 million to 79 museums with visual arts collections across the United States. In addition, we decided to expand our commitment from $5 million to a total of $10 million and to continue the program in 2022 and 2023. Making it possible for us to do this, as has been noted, is the extraordinary collaboration with the experts at RMI and at Environment and Culture Partners who have helped us build and execute this program. We are honored by and grateful for this partnership. Thank you so much. Uh, and I believe now we'll turn it over to Jules. Thank you. And um, let me uh, hand it over to Victor, uh, because Victor, uh, you've been uh, helping shape uh, the program at the uh, Helen Frankenthaler um, Foundation. Uh, tell us uh, how uh, we can actually drive impact at museums with the program that we've helped design. Great. Well, thank you, Elizabeth and Fred and Jules. You've set this up nicely. We uh, really do have a lot of opportunity to uh, help with climate change through museums. As many of you know, um, buildings are a huge uh, part of the climate problem and part of the climate solution. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, many of you know, but it's about 36% of the carbon emissions in the United States comes from buildings. Three quarters of the electricity use is done in buildings. And so by addressing uh, these issues in museums, we can have a huge impact on our climate goals. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, <clears throat> one of the worst kept secrets is that uh, energy efficiency is actually very profitable. Um, <laughs> so uh, I would like you all to kind of remember that in case you had doubts about it. Uh, when we invest in building efficiency, we also have the benefits of reduced climate impact and energy costs. And reducing our energy costs pr can provide a direct payback on investment. Uh, sometimes it's quick, sometimes it takes longer. But as it's shown here, if you invested about uh, half a trillion dollars in efficiency in U.S. buildings today, you would get that back plus about 1.4 uh, trillion dollars. So that's about a 38 percent, excuse me, 24 percent average return on investment, uh, which is not bad. Most people would like that. Uh, so we should all take advantage of this uh, whenever we have the opportunity. Uh, next slide. So the question is, why isn't this happening more broadly? Why isn't everybody just retrofitting uh, museums? Well, or their buildings. 
there's a lot of good uh, reasons. There's a lot of different perceptions about this. Uh, for example, sometimes people, uh, there, there might be a split incentive where a tenant pays for their energy bills directly and then the landlord has no financial incentive to upgrade their buildings because they're not gonna basically receive any of the uh, payback. Sometimes people don't have, uh, they don't know about the opportunities uh, for investment in energy efficiency as uh, Fred mentioned uh, early on here. Uh, they might not have the technical knowledge of knowing what to do, or they might not know what the return on investment might be. They might think it's risky and not you know, a good thing to do. Um, but I think oftentimes it's really just that it's not a primary business for, uh, for the people that own buildings and they might need their cash to you know, invest in something else. And that is really where the Frankenthaler Climate Initiative is so impactful because uh, we are able to, you know, when you have your funding pegged for some other needs that you have to keep your business running, um, we can come up with uh, some funding for upgrades and have energy efficiency be part of the solution here. So that's really what this granting program is doing is filling that gap. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So cultural institutions are critical in this game. Uh, <clears throat> energy use in a museum, uh, as mentioned, is typically the second largest cost. So as soon as you start to address that and reduce the costs associated with uh, providing the heating and cooling and the lighting in a museum, uh, then you might actually have more money for the staff and for the running of the museum. So it's a sustainability in the operations of the museum, as well as sustainability from a climate perspective. Uh, energy efficiency is also a great payback uh, because that can also help unleash other gifts, other money that is part of uh, keeping the, a building running. Uh, and sometimes that can increase the overall amount of money that's available and create deeper uh, savings. And that deeper savings can actually allow for deeper investments. So you can get the sort of uh, increasing returns and but from a climate perspective as well as a financial perspective. So it's really a great investment in that way. But really the thing that uh, museums give us that a lot of other institutions don't is that leadership aspect, right? So um, having museums lead on climate change uh, is going to catalyze more people to invest in energy efficiency and have that significant impact. Uh, next slide, please. So <clears throat> art museums have been neglected a little bit as, as has been mentioned. And you know, while that's uh, a shame that that has been the case, it also means that there's a big opportunity there for investment. So technology has uh, really uh, changed a lot over the last you know, 30 years. And uh, for example, the way we use light in a museum is an opportunity for having better perception of artwork and better experience in the museum better preservation of the artwork, and also we can have better energy savings. So that is uh, one of the ideas that modernizing these systems can really help. The same thing is true with uh, mechanical systems uh, and other kinds of uh, aspects of museums that we uh, can now make more cost effective and actually improve the experience. Um, <clears throat> finally, uh, I would like to talk a little bit more about the grants that are actually available here. So uh, next slide. Uh, we are offering three kinds of grants through the Frankenthaler Climate Initiative. Uh, the first are these scoping grants. And the scoping grants um, really are meant to help you figure out what needs to be done. It can actually be a little bit more than that. You can actually audit the museum, do some monitoring or uh, commissioning, which commissioning actually helps you make sure that your building is running correctly. Uh, very few buildings out there are optimal in the way that they're currently running and having these scoping grants can be part of have immediately having some impact as well as figuring out how to get to these clever deep energy retrofits. Uh, next slide. The second type of grant that we offer is a technical assistance grant. And these are really good for helping you kind of figure out the design and specification of the uh, sorts of things that ought to be done. Um, and also they can help you uh, hire people that will allow you to get more funding. So it can actually help you get more funding directly or actually work with an energy service company 
that therefore can um, provide some kind of financing as well. The third type of grant um, is an implementation grant. And as it says, it's about implementation, um, getting things done. And uh, sometimes these are seed funding grants, right? So it would provide a little bit of money that would get batched in order to get to uh, the final uh, implementation. Uh, or sometimes it can actually cover the whole uh, amount of the, uh, the uh, retrofit. If it's a small lighting retrofit or you know, a single piece of equipment needs to be replaced, the implementation grant may cover the whole thing, in which, which is fantastic, because really then we can start saving more carbon and more energy immediately. And that's really what the Frankenthaler Climate Initiative is all about. Um, so that's the overall approach uh, of the Frankenthaler Climate Initiative, directly addressing climate change, using our cultural institutions, uh, and providing scoping grants, technical assistance, and implementation grants. Uh, and it's really quite effective, but uh, to tell you more about how effective that can be, I'd like to turn this over to Sarah Sutton. Uh, Sarah? Sarah, you might be on mute. Not so rookie mistake, sorry, thank you. So thank you, Victor. And I'm very pleased to be able to tell you about these marvelous projects and our applicants. So if I could see the next slide, please. We'll give you an overview of the variety of applications. Now it's important to understand that we didn't have an ideal applicant or an ideal project in mind when we set out the call for proposals. We did have criteria, energy efficiency and clean energy projects. And we did have a focus of visual arts museums to fill a gap in this funding. But it was important to us that the applicants tell us what mattered to them, what was most important, where they were in their green journey and what would make the biggest difference at that point. So you see there are a variety of types of museums and types of projects here. So a quarter of them were audits or plans where they were either at the beginning of their whole journey or the beginning of a journey of a specific project. A little less than a quarter were replacing mechanical equipment. And it was very impressive, the types of applications where they were ready to rock and roll. They had their system designed, they knew what they needed to install in order to have a more efficient, effective approach. A little less than that were participating in relamping projects, whether it was their first relamping project or the seventh out of eight galleries being done, but an important place to look for efficiencies. And then of course, building envelope and building systems controls were important to a number of applicants. So let's go to the next slide, please. I'm going to show you six, represent, six sample projects. Victor mentioned that there were scoping, technical assistance and implementation grants and I'll show you two of each. We could have picked any from the 79 awards, and these two are nice examples I wanna share with you. So starting with Fenimore Art Museum up in upstate New York, at the beginning of their green work, they have to analyze an aging HVAC system. You see there that it's got system parts from the 1990s. You're looking at a historic structure and a significant historic structure with a significant art collection and they need advice on where to go first. And they can use that advice and recommendation to do the fundraising for the rest of the project. So that's how we're leveraging more funding for this work. Let's see the next slide, please. So Florence Griswold Museum in Connecticut doing a site whole institution master planning project, looking at a national register property sitting on the edge of a river looking at historic structures and modern structures and thinking about what would be their next steps. So an ASHRAE level two audit that's going to help them do facility planning and to use that planning in order to look for funding to support the grander vision of the museum. Next please. So a technical assistance grant now go all the way out to Puerto Rico. This is also a resilience project. So having experienced devastation during an earthquake, they're rebuilding the structure. They're looking at the cement walls and this time they wanna build it with vapor barriers. So they're going to be doing seismic retrofitting but they're going to improve the structure so that they have better control of temperature and relative humidity inside the building to care for the objects. What that tells us is that they're also thinking in a climate smart way. 
it is only going to get more challenging in Puerto Rico to manage conditions inside this building because of climate change. And with this new approach, they'll be better able to do that. Next slide, please. Let's see one more technical assistance grant. So this is different than the others. This is the Met Cloisters. This is an institution that is thinking at the main Met and Met Cloisters institution-wide about greening the museum. What are the best strategic approaches? They've looked into solar, they've looked into wind, and they wanna get rid of 4,000 barrels of oil a year. What's the next opportunity? They have good indications that geothermal is that solution. So we're supporting the, that project in order to see what the potential is there. Next slide, please. So I have two more to show you, implementation grants. And I wanted to share this example because the Davis Museum is on uh, a higher education campus. There's a great program called Second Nature, which does good work in order to help higher ed come up with carbon goals and meet those goals. So you see that they've got a 2040 carbon neutral goal. Let's just celebrate that and be really pleased that the museum is part of that effort. Very often in higher ed, the museums and the galleries are the last ones to be thought of in this work. And now the Davis Museum is part of that. We're funding the LED project. It's part of a larger package. You see that they're actually listing that submetering is one of their projects that they're working on. That's the kind of thing we want to see happening at these sites. And we hope applicants come to us with those projects in the future. And then the last one I'll show you. Next slide, please. California Indian Museum and Cultural Center. Also, and it's an implementation grant, but it's also a resilience grant. They're so far in their climate journey that they already have the solar panels up and working. They're in a high fire risk area. What they want to be able to do is stole, store solar energy so that they can run for three days with clean, cool air inside the building for objects and for people as a cooling center, a healthy, safe cooling center. Whether their area is shut down intentionally to avoid fire damage, so I mean the, the power is shut down, or it's a power outage because of a storm event. They have three days of resilience there with this project. All those projects are something we're so proud of and so encouraged by that we're really thrilled to have been able to do this. And we're thrilled that the applicants brought us such great ideas. So I'll stop there and I'll turn it over to Jules. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And can I invite all of our panelists now to turn their cameras back on? Um, uh, there we go. I see Elizabeth, I see Victor, Sarah, Fred, turn on your camera in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. There you are, great. Uh, and we can have a bit of a dialogue here over the next uh, 20 minutes. And I, I'd like to, uh, to ask the first question to you, Elizabeth. Uh, how has this initiative been received? What has been the response from the art sector, from the culture sector? We've had a tremendous response from all corners of the art world. Uh, it's been extremely positive and enthusiastic. And I think in large part, of course, it's because few others are supporting initiatives of this kind in the visual arts. Uh, we certainly hope that this great you know, outburst of, of excitement one will inspire others to step up and join us to help museums with the resources they need to affect change. Great, thank you. And uh, Sarah, do we already have some indication that if a museum does a sustainability project, does an, an, an a climate change or energy efficiency project, that visitors to the museum react positively? I realize that the projects that we're granting to are still in implementation or only just getting started, but has there been prior experience that we can refer to? The answer is definitely yes. The public responds well when they know that the museum is doing this kind of work. Sometimes museums forget to tell the public they are because they think some of the back of house activities really aren't of interest. But every time they do, they get good feedback because the public appreciates that the museum is doing a good job with its charitable contributions, the limited resources available to it, and on behalf of the community in an education point of view and a health and safety point of view. Uh, it's not an art museum example I have for you, but the Detroit Zoo planned a um, 
single use plastic phase out project for three years. And they did an excellent job of preparing the public. By the end of three years, there will be no single use water bottles on property. They met their goal within two years, absolutely zero pushback from the public and instead great encouragement and appreciation that they were doing this work because it was for the good of everyone. So I've yet to run across a museum who struggled in any way for doing this kind of work. Great. And, and building on a point that Victor made earlier, not everybody understands how energy efficiency in the built environment can be so uh, profitable and so uh, make such an easy impact, right? Uh, so, so would that be a theme that you would highlight in, in any announcement around the progress that museums are making? Yes, and. So yes, I would love that they would say what the return on investment is, how quickly it's paid back. And they explain how they reinvest that money in the mission of the institution, in the educational programs, or in more sustainability work. And when Fred and the board were designing this project, one of the messages was, this frees up money to reinvest in art education, art purchases, um, public engagement. And that's really valuable. When they are able, when the museum is able to articulate their savings and how they reinvest that money, that's a sweet spot for me. Here, here. Uh, Jules, I just want to say what Sarah's saying was extremely important in our thinking it through because one of the things that I kept saying to the board is not only are we making a gift to the climate here in making a gift to the museums, we're making a gift to the museums in terms of their financial stability and, 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 and their income and lowering their costs. So this is a, 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 an ongoing continuous uh, uh, endowment. Um, through through energy savings that will go on for you know, for decades, I, you know I hope forever, uh, uh, and, and and that's 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 the thing that nobody talks about. But but the, the, that the the people need to learn how much cheaper clean energy is. Um, and and Fred, let me let me build on that because um, my hunch is that. You've talked about this idea with many of your friends. I know you, you're passionate about the things you do. And, and what has been the response among your circle of friends and, and, and associates when, uh, who I think are probably involved in the art scene in many ways and maybe donors to museums? Have they said, oh, that sounds so boring or have they embraced it? Um, you're asking me. The, yeah, the, the, yeah the, you're, the, the, you're talking about it. No, right? no, no, I, I'm, I'm out proselytizing. And, and um, the, 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 in the US where the program, we, we've not gone outside the United States. And I don't know if we ever will. We are an arts foundation, so we, we definitely do things internationally. I mean, Elizabeth uh, and I were in London uh, uh, just days ago together at a show of Helen's at the Dulwich Picture Gallery in London. And we've, been, we've had shows at the Tate, et cetera, et cetera. So we're very active. Uh, 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 globally, we've had shows in Norway and you know all over the place, um, and 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 more and more in Europe. As Helen, uh, um, Helen, who's very well known in America, uh, now I mean, 15 years ago, if I mentioned Helen's name in England, people drew a blank. Now she's an extremely well known artist, and so uh, um, and so. But but the answer is, it's it's dual. In the United States, where private philanthropy dominates people immediately pick up on it and say, okay, we should be doing that at our institution. In Europe, people, uh, philanthropy and, and, and museums almost are entirely uh, uh, government funded because it comes through out of, out of people's taxes. Um, so, but at the same time, European governments are much more on the forward foot on climate change than American governments. So, so the, the, the net effect of that is that Europeans tend to be more passive and more complacent about it because they assume it's being taken care of. Yeah. And I don't know, I, don't, I frankly haven't explored what the situation is. I, I just got to look at the new Courtauld galleries in London, as Elizabeth knows. I'm on the US uh, um, Friends of the, the, the National Gallery in London in the US. I was at a dinner in Cambridge Monday 
at the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge. And, and, and Jules, you're making me want to call up everybody and say, what's, what's your- What are you doing here? about it? Okay. So, 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 um, uh, but, uh, so, but the answer is in, in the United States, um, when I talked to uh, a, a friend of mine who's a trustee of the Met, and, 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 and by the way, I've gotten many nice calls from people. I mean, a friend of mine who's the, 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 the chairman of the Wellesley Endowment called up and said, you know, just, we have to work together, said, thank you, you know, we got, we got the thing. I said, it's not me, it's, it's Helen, okay? But, but, uh, uh, but, uh, but, you know, there's been a lot of acknowledgement and, and, and people are, are sort of shoulder to shoulder in the climate effort. Um, I would love to, to, to find out more, and I'm going to, about what's going on in Europe. Super. And, and that um, illustrates a point that I think is, is important. Uh, storytelling around what we can do about climate change is a powerful way of inspiring others. Uh, Victor, you are a veteran of the buildings program at RMI 15 years, and, and you've helped tell a very powerful story on um, energy efficiency in the built environment with an iconic building in New York uh, uh, that, that really tells that story. And the reason I'm bringing it up is that is also an antique building, an old building. And, and maybe museum directors say, well, I don't want all this new stuff in my beautiful old building, but you did that at the Empire State Building. Can you draw the analogy there? Sure. Um, <clears throat> that was about 10 years ago. Uh, so one of the great things is that, you know, when you, it's like the best time to plant a tree is 10 years ago, right? And energy efficiency continues to, uh, to pay back. And so the climate and financial returns say that let's do it quickly, right? Let's do it now. Uh, with the Empire State Building, uh, they were planning on doing some renovations to that project. And uh, RMI was able to come in with a great team um, to work on uh, analyzing how the money was being spent for the renovation of that building. And it was really through some analysis and some sleuthing uh, and some understanding of how that building was using energy that we were able to sort of reallocate some of the resources and go from what was going to be about a 5% energy savings to about a 40% annual energy savings, which meant that the amount of money that was invested in that paid back in about three and a half years. And for the last six and a half years, they've been basically making money off of that. So it's, that's a really great thing with museums as well. Um, people might not know technically what how their building is using energy or how to save the energy. But um, if you sleuth around and you actually think about energy efficiency in conjunction with, uh, we need to think more about preservation of artwork. We need to think more about the integrity of the building envelope or some other kind of capital investment. It is possible to integrate those ideas together in a way that you can have better energy efficiency, good paybacks, uh, deep energy savings and carbon savings and result in something that's going to be a long lasting good investment. And as Fred mentioned, also helps the sustainability of the museum by providing more income and uh, a better bottom line for the actual operation of the place. So yeah, the um, Empire State Building was great because it's a landmark, it's a, um, a lighthouse, people see it and it's a, it's a great thing to look at but even the more sort of pedestrian buildings can benefit from that same approach. Um, but cultural museums are great because you got a lot of people walking through them and if they see that you've saved 50% of your energy or you've managed to integrate solar and the building looks just the same, that's fantastic. And it's a really good uh, story to tell to others. Thank if you. I could just say one thing, departing from what Victor said, which is that when we discussed it at the foundation, we decided to confine ourselves. We're an arts foundation. And Helen in her lifetime participated in many art forms. So she, um, um, I remember very much going, I went to Covent Garden um, and there was a ballet. Helen did the sets and, uh, um, and the costumes. Um, uh, she was very involved in, 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 in music. And in, uh, 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 she loved doing set design. Uh, the whole family came over for that. Uh, and so 
that got me thinking, and I did raise it with my fellow directors uh, and, and Elizabeth as to whether or not we wanted to expand our scope at this stage, because we didn't know what the reception would be. You know, we didn't know if there would be five museums that would apply or the 79 who did. Now it happened that, that our capacity so far has been taken up by museums, but I did raise the question with everyone and say, you know, we could expand beyond this. There's a role here for art schools, architecture schools, and then you, 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 you under the under the law that governs foundations, if we wanted to, we could we could branch out, and and we're not going to because right now we're entirely focused on art museums. Um, maybe someday we will. But the performing arts, I mean, wh whoever is out there and listening, and has a foundation and would like to do this in other art arenas, they need it. Okay, because whether it's theaters whether it's Lincoln Center, whether it's, you know, the Lincoln Centers of, 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 of around the world in China or, or, or et cetera, et cetera, all the great, before. I was at the Vienna Staatsoper. I mean, that building needs some climate help, okay? <laughs> it doesn't need any help on the music. The music's fantastic, okay? But the building was, it was built in, 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 in the 19th century. And so um, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a much bigger picture beyond art museums for the, the cultural world in general to get on the climate bandwagon. Super. Well, and that builds nicely on a question I just got in the chat window from Harry Shear. How can museums grow financial support from donors and the philanthropic community for sustainability projects without potentially cannibalizing current donor support for the museum's core mission? Uh, Sarah, Elizabeth, uh, do you have any views? I do have a thought about that. Uh, the climate funders tend not to be um, traditional museum funders, or you could say it the other way. Traditional museum funders tend not to have been working in the climate space at the moment. So I think what this really does is broaden the pool of funders. When the funders understand that there's a need and an opportunity that is so actionable, it's as if the museum sector is, has been missing from the climate discussion. It, if it's not uh, a natural space, if it's like an open air space with um, adorable mammals involved, it's just not on people's radar. Uh, and that's why this initiative is so helpful is it points out that <laughs> Museums are buildings too. If 36% of the buildings are, if 36% of greenhouse gases comes from buildings and 74% is from the electricity running these buildings and, and other operations, museums have a really big role to play in that. So sharing the message that museums are climate actors and that those costs are knowable and manageable is really important on the side of the funders as well as the museum applicants. We have to broaden the pool, but it can be done. And when in doubt, just emphasize the co-benefits of the energy efficiency with mission design. And sometimes people will say, but they don't wanna, they don't wanna fund the HV AC system. We talked about that. Reframe the discussion as capacity building because we save so much money, we save so much maintenance effort when we change these systems, that it's an investment in the organization. Just like Fred said, it's an endowment. It's a gift that keeps on giving. It's good for the health of the organization. And if I could add to that, I think if, I mean, to for, give you a very specific idea, one could, and, and in response to that question, one could make, let's say one is going to make a gift to a museum of whatever amount, yeah, pick a number, $25,000. Um, and you're gonna make a gift of $25,000 because you're going to fund the acquisition of a particular kind of art that one likes. Let's say uh, um, 20th century British uh, uh, modern uh, painting, because I just was in England. Um, and, or actually let's say abstract expressionists. Okay. <laughs> the, um, and uh, you could give a gift to the museum and say, 
here's a climate gift to be spent on climate and all, and it's quite calculable as Victor will confirm, all the dividends, the energy dividends that come from this $25,000 expenditure will be spent on abstract expressionism or British modernism or whatever you want. That you, so you can integrate the two and, and basically make it the same gift without can, one cannibalizing the other. In fact, you could probably raise more money that way uh, uh, for, for it. The second thing is Jules and I have a mutual friend who is a director of RMI and he's in the, in the cogen business in a big way. And he recently told me that he redid uh, um, the campus. I'm not gonna say which one, uh, um, but of a very well-known American school. And one of their alums is a climate donor. He's a climate, he's passionate about climate. That's his cause. And there was a capital cost to converting the campus to clean energy, a one-time cost with a dividend. And he stepped up and paid that because, so identifying the climate donor is a way of not, you know, who, who, as Sarah says, is not your typical regular donor. It's a different agenda. Uh, it's a very good way to do it without cannibalizing your traditional donor base. Thank you, Fred. That is a wonderful way, I think, to um, uh, put a very clear um, uh, point on the multiple benefits associated with these investments in our future and in the beautiful arts that surround us uh, and how these two come together. Uh, it is my task to wrap up now. And I want to start by saying a big thank you to our panelists, Elizabeth, Sarah, uh, Victor. Uh, thank you very much for, for this inspiring discussion. Thank you to the audience for, for joining us. I hope that the ideas that you heard here today encourage you to look at your own uh, museums, your own facilities, uh, your own uh, institutions and say, what can we do to lessen our building's impact on the climate? But also through doing that, what stories can we tell about all of our abilities to tackle this planetary emergency? Museum administrators on the line, please consider applying to the Frankenthal Climate Initiative grant this fall. You'll find more information uh, at frankenthalerclimateinitiative.org, uh, uh, or you can email at info, info at frankenthalerclimateinitiative.org. Um, we'll be sending the recording of today's webinar to everybody who registered. Um, thank you all, but a very special thank you, Fred, to you. Um, when you and I got to know each other in the context of uh, this conversation, I very quickly discovered that uh, one word to summarize everything you do is passion. And uh, you have beautifully brought together here uh, the passion of your aunt uh, for art uh, and the passion that we all should feel for uh, the future of our planet uh, for next generations. And your leadership, your vision in launching this initiative uh, bringing your board along and, and making this program happen is deeply appreciated by all of us. Enjoy the rest of New York Climate Week, everyone. Thank you very much for being here and hope to see uh, the projects that you are launching in uh, your museum uh, very quickly uh, when I next visit. Thank and Jules, you thank you for RMI, because without you, we couldn't have done it. Seriously, okay? With pleasure. Thank you all. Bye-bye. <laughs>